This might be a game of number two against number four, but under the surface, it's actually a game of survival. M80 are going to playoffs, but they're only four points above Beast Coast, who could usurp them in the top two if they were to win today. But Beast Coast, for their own part, are trying to lock in playoffs, which they can do with a win. And if they don't, then suddenly, because of all of the jostling that happens in the North American League standings, they could even lose that top four position if they don't win today. So big stakes, even if on paper, it doesn't actually demonstrate it for both Beast Coast and M80 in this game. I'd say it's huge stakes because both yep. teams in my opinion have a similar element of creativity they're both very fresh teams to watch a lot of new additions and beast coast i mean we talk about it, it's a band of misfits and it's nice to see them finally find a little bit of more success yeah i think beast coast was a team where coming into the stage a lot of people had different expectations some people saw this roster and said you know what they've got no history playing together who's this diffuser guy they're not going to do anything <laughs> some people took a look and they're like hot and cold that guy rocks uh you know the rest of these players Tons of experience, mm -hmm. all gonna pop off. So, I mean, I think a lot of people were questioning where Beast Coast would finish, and I, I like the idea that they could finish quite high in these standings, because they still got a great opportunity to get those points. A lot of people must have thought Diffuser would be planting. Uh, <laughs> ah! Uh, yeah, it would have. Yeah. Yeah. God, I hate it here. Both teams are entering today on three game win streaks. Beast Coast were 0-3 to start and then famously have worked their way all the way back up to a 500 record. Meanwhile, three games ago was when LG beat M80 and they've won everything since then and are still one of the best teams categorically in basically every stat that we track at this point. Yeah, M80 are an extremely strong team right now. Obviously, we saw their stats there, second across the board. If they win today, they jump up the first, at least in the standings. I don't know about the attacking and defensive win percentages, but they're playing very well across the board. As you said, Jacob, this is a team that we've seen have really big individual moments, but they also can play together really well. Well, let's give Beast Coast some props before we jump too hard on the team that is currently in second. These guys were in third to start the day, but now they've gone down to fourth because of Wild Card's win. But yesterday, 7-5 over SSG on Cafe. First half, they went blow for blow, but in the second, they adapted wonderfully to some adept shield play one four round straight and handed SSG a losing record for the first time in a year. Yeah, Beast Co is on a bit of a streak now. I believe three maps in a row they've been able to take down and it really does feel like they're starting to put themselves into a strong position. I think that last game against Space Station, despite it starting a little bit rocky, especially on that first half, their ability to get that plant down, focus consistently with the Monty plays, turn it around after their tack timeouts, really impressed me. So from Beast Co's point of view, I think there's a team that comes through with a lot a lot of great ideas, and they absolutely could shut things down here. Well, we talked to Spirits before we got into the Super Week competition, and this is when Beast Coast were really starting to amp their wins up very slowly. So let's see what he had to say coming into Super Week. Our team is like built from four different like main team. Like we had we have players from SSG, DZ, from Wildcard, from Sonics, and it's all different play style, but all combined to like one that we're like all comfortable on. Like our adaptability and like our change of the pace is super good. We're just very like uh, unpredictable. I think the Fuser's performance uh, from last week has been like showing like his real like potential. The, during the first week, we had like an identity crisis. We we were still figuring out roles. We were still figuring out like what who was better at what spot, who was better at what role. And we had the fuser on the role that it didn't really fit his style. And now that we put him on on the role that he wants, the role that he performs well, he's been like showing like some amazing potential and he's been performing super well. The chemistry has been amazing since the beginning of the team. But it keeps every week it keeps improving improving and like the potential like this is just a sky like we double scrim every day for the past like month almost and been putting a lot a lot of work to like set the top and to become like a top team What was once a point that we were really critical of Beast Coast on and confused about where all these different players would fit as they came from different teams now seems like it's a real strength for a team that has now really started to figure some things out. But true to form, it's come with trial and error. Some things had to go wrong first for them to actually have something to fix, and they have been fixing it pretty decently so far. They have, and I'm happy we heard Spirits address the identity crisis. It feels good when you say something on the desk and the players are able to confirm it themselves because we've talked about it a lot. But not only has changing the diffuser the diffuser made them not only play a lot more comfortably but we've been able to notice it in their play by the way that they've been able to observe adapt and overcome 
every single round, not only outside of the server, but inside of the server. This is their game against SSG, and there was a few first few starting rounds where Beast Coast was not identifying the problem against SSG. They were letting J90 play in the bathroom up here, uncontested. They were going very slow, trying to utilize their utility to win the game when they want to go for the plant. And unfortunately, when you give players like J90 uncontested ability, they're able to take advantage of it. And this is a round where Beast Coast notifies that. They understand it completely. We cannot play based off of utility. We need to be able to use our Monty pretty much bring it out and start going for these fast plays. And this was a huge read that they were able to understand. We don't need to go off utility. Let's try to focus just on going for the execute very fast. This round, they get the diffuser down. And obviously, right here, they use the Monty again to get a critical position and continue mm -hmm. to go fast. They weren't letting SSG slow them out like they were prior. They were able to read it, adapt, and improve live in front of our eyes. And I think a big reason why they're so strong in this uh, in this sense is because of hot and cold. You know, after that game, we talked to him in the interview and I asked him the question, you, you went 3-3 on cafe defenses, were you worried? And he said, you know what? I'm the attacking IGL. I'm confident in my team's attacks. I knew we could bring it back. And he was absolutely right. They did just that. Yeah, they started slow. They didn't have all those uh, answers right at the beginning, but they problem solved, they figured it out and they finished with some really strong attacks. Well, it was four rounds in a row as soon as they picked up the Monty and decided we're going to use all of our strats and combine all of our efforts on just this one player. And it worked out. They beat Space Station yesterday and another team in this lobby has already already also done that so far this stage, it's M80. They've only lost one game, it was to LG on Skyscraper, and at this point, it basically feels like ancient history. They beat Lost yesterday on Clubhouse, but oh boy, that thing came really, really close. I think closer for comfort than any of the guys on M80 would have appreciated. I want to say a lot of M80's games have been very close. They're a very consistent team so far, and I'd say they have a little bit of everything. They're very good at everything, but I'm going to need to see a little bit more consistency to be able to say that they're great at everything, but I think they're almost there. Yeah, and I think probably the biggest thing that I've seen from them has been their attacking roam clearing. And in fact, they've been the best team out of all of the North American squads with the Deimos usage. The newest operator joined Team Rainbow. M80 have actually ran Deimos more than every other team combined. Ten rounds from M80, nine from all of the other squads put together. You can see the uh, percentages there. Solid win rate with it, 50% overall. You see Spoit running it six times. Citizen has the other four or the other four plays for M80. The way they like to use this operator is actually pretty different depending on who's running it. When you've got Spoit on the operator, oftentimes you'll see him kind of playing a little bit farther back, maybe feeding that information to his teammates so that they can go in and try to grab that kill, um, which is kind of what you're seeing here from Citizen as well. But when Citizen plays the operator, he's more so honestly just playing for the gun, trying to go in for the lurk. He does a great job of sometimes not even using the gadget, but finding a lot of kills when he's playing that operator anyways. I've been loving the different ways that we've seen M80 use this new Deimos operator. I don't think there's any team in North America who's doing it quite as well as them. They're bringing a lot of different looks with the new operator, not only just Deimos, but they have picked 28 different operators on attack. The number one team has picked 29. Mm -hmm. So it's almost there, but we see a lot of creativity and from everybody. We obviously remember uh, Kino jumping in the CEO window and <laughs> kicking somebody to stop the plan. That's going to live in infamy yeah. for a couple months at this point. Yeah, It is, but we've seen a lot of operators. The Yang, the Monty, the Deimos, the Grim, and it's very refreshing to see them try to just switch it up every single look that we see out of M80. Maps are in for this matchup that, again, will decide whether Beast Coast lock in playoffs or not. It's Oregon, and they have defense first. I kind of like the battleground, even though we've seen a whole bunch of Oregon recently. What do we think of the pick? No. No? <laughs> no? Oh, well, this is stressing me out. Oregon is just a map where I feel like everyone has such a good playing ground. Everything's yeah. so consistent. Any team could win. So when you look at it and you're like, oh, that matey might be a little stronger. It goes to Oregon. It doesn't matter at that point. Yeah, it's also one we've not seen from Beast Coast so far through the season. They've True. been kind of maybe keeping it under wraps. Uh, we've seen a lot of Oregon from the other teams, but not from Beast Coast just yet. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad choice coming through maybe a little bit risky from M80, but we do always talk about Oregon. It is very default, so there's only so much you can do to kind of catch your opponents off guard. I really want to know if Foxy's reaction to seeing the map is also going to lend into predictions by too much, just because you don't, like, we said no when we saw Wildcard play a whole bunch, but this is different territory for both teams here. So who do you take? Oh my, I'm I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I have to switch it. I initially was going to pick M80, but when I'm seeing the map, I mean, I... I I feel like there's a reason that Beast Coast went to it. And when I look at the roster, who would win a 10-man, pretty much, just a sure. 5v5, mm -hmm. I would pick Beast Coast on Oregon. Okay. 
I don't know. I think M80. <laughs> the way that they've played the game so far, I think M80's uh, ability to pick apart the defenses that we're going to be seeing from Beast Coast should be quite strong. I think Beast Coast have been relatively reliant on playing these like really plant-focused games, which sometimes can be tougher to get done. You really need to uh, be able to win the early game sometimes on Oregon. So I'm, I'm sticking with M80. I'm not too, 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 too worried about the map. Okay. But yeah, this could be a close game. Yeah, I mean, it's just funny. Laxing's jumped up, so now Fox kind of has to do anything he can to get a leg I mean, up. Yeah, Lax is just trying to be different. But when yeah. I look, I agree with your points. When I look at M80, I'd see it, say, you know, maybe a player like Sport or Citizen. I feel like they're so talented that the map doesn't matter. Yeah. And when I look at player to player, I feel like Oregon is going to help Beast Coast more than it'll help M80. Okay, so you agree with his points, but you also don't agree with his points as well. I agree with his points. It's fair. I don't think but I respectfully disagree. disagree. It's fair play. Let's see which analyst comes out on top. Is Larlaxing and Jesse uh, right on this one, or is Fox A going to do literally whatever it takes to equalize his percentage? We'll see. It's Carter Hannafeld and Sam Stokes with the call. You know what I think? You know what I think? Against a team that is on the come up, why would you take them to a default map where they don't have to really worry on inventing a whole lot of new stuff? Now, to be fair, Sam, I will say this. While I do think I agree with Fox that I think this map certainly helps Beast Coast more than it uh, helps M80, at the same time, if we can just reduce the factors that Sploit has to think about when he's entering on the map, I don't think they're going to complain a whole lot. <laughs> very true. Very, very true. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and rounding that off, I, I think Oregon is going to be a, a pretty good catalyst for both of these teams to really see what the hell is going on in North America. You and I had like a 10 minute conversation uh, in the green room about what the heck is going on, wh what's really going on for NA. Uh, and, and it's been a pretty wild stage so far. I mean, when your technical worst team in the entire region is Los, who have still looked like they could potentially stand the test of time with this roster, there's a lot of really good things happening for this region. Uh, and there's a lot of really good things happening for both of these squads that we have respectively. M80 and Beast Coast have both looked fantastic. Uh, and for kind of dim, uh, you know, similar circumstances uh, a little bit, but uh, for some other things as well. We'll start with M80 here. I've really liked what we've seen from M80 this stage. I, I think they've looked really, really good, especially for the uh, uh, amount of people that they ended up picking you know, inside of the stage, or rather picking up inside of the uh, the off period before this stage, uh, they look so very dynamic, especially with the players that they, you know, had chosen that are completely across, like, the, the entire spectrum. You got players coming in from Europe, players coming in from, uh, you know, Brazil, players coming in from America. It, it's crazy. It's completely across the board. Yeah. Uh, I think m &D have done a really, really good job of being able to tie this whole thing together. And not only that, but kick off a pretty competitive stage with a uh, really good shout at making playoffs. You know, whereas for Beast Coast, I think that they've uh, shown up in a lot of different regards, uh, especially with some of the new, play, uh, you know, players that they've picked up as well. Uh, the shining hope, the shining beacon for me for BC uh, for their off period was definitely hot and cold coming into this roster just because he's been a, a really long-standing player, you know, Carter? Yeah. And and not only that, but like, although he's been a long-standing player, sometimes you have to worry about players when they when they get up there in age as well. Do they of care course. as much anymore? Are they, are they in it to win it? That kind of thing. That's something I have never been concerned with, with hot and cold. And it shows once again here on Beast Coast, he is worth his stock, man. He is such a solid player and BC has looked really solid because of that. They have. I mean, his calling on Beast Coast, you know, stepping into a bit more of a leadership role where, I mean, he's mentored younger players. He's been sort of the veteran on rosters. I mean, comparatively speaking, I mean, obviously, you know, Fultz was spent on SSG for years now. So bringing on players like Forrest, like Jane, I know, there is a bit of a mentorship there. You know, they are younger. They are a bit newer in terms of tenure. So Hot and Cold's been, I think, in a mentor or leader figure before, but actually in game, kind of coming off his lurker role on Space Station and on previous teams and actually fully taking on kind of the more IGL role and being a leader in and out of game. It looks like he's been doing it his whole life, man. I mean, the yeah. the jump between that change, between stepping up to the plate, when you have that experience, I imagine it does make calling a little easier, but aside, outside of those first couple play days when, I mean, they'd only been a roster for a, maybe a month or so with very little to no game day experience, Hot and Cold is looking really quite strong in that leadership role. But I... I have to say, I'm a bit insulted that you forgot to bring up somebody on M80 because it has not been, you know, Sploit. That has been my standout player on M80. It's not been Cameraman coming in as this experienced IGL. The re-education, the revival of Kino's playing career, <laughs> now that he has been taken out of Hard Breach and Monty Jail, has been 
one of the most entertaining things to watch this stage. I, I can entirely agree with you. Also, the uh, little shout out to uh, the re-education of Lauren Hill there as well. Shout out to you <laughs> on that, Carter. Amazing. But yeah, the re-education of Kino and his reapplication to M80 has been uh, more than a firecracker. Let me tell you, this guy has been his own monsoon. If you want to take uh, you know a feather out of the cap of Beast Coast, he's been so impeccable this entire stage. And yeah, I I'll be right there with you carrying this cross, my friend, because he has looked so stellar. On this map especially, if you want to take it specifically to Oregon, this was, you know, the second game M80 had played. We'd just seen them beat Wildcard, and at the time, we were, we, you know, unfortunately weren't taking Wildcard all that seriously yet, given this, uh, you know, the roster's middling success previously, but especially going up against a team like M80, we're like, okay, you got to win 074 on Chalet, a map we think you're better at anyway. What do you actually have to offer against a team like the Sonics next week and on Oregon? It looked a bit shaky, the attacks are a bit slow, but what was really great was when they were starting to stall, when they were starting to struggle. A lot of the times, Spoilmade was doing a lot of work, but Kino in particular was finding huge multi-frags entering into the site on basement or clearing upstairs to bring M80 back into the game. And as the ban phase has transpired, there's a lot of things to talk about, in particular that Blitz ban, but Kino in general, but on this map in particular when M80 played it against SQ, was such an instrumental player to give them a fighting chance on attacks that had honestly gone awry. This ban phase was gorgeous, by the way. Uh, just to let you know while we're in the background here, for, for the ops at least. Uh, M80 are going to ban out Blitz and Soul. So we'll get to the shield thing, because you and I talked about that in the green room. But uh, I really want to point out the fact that M80 banned Solus here. Because the last time around, what do we see them ban out, folks? We saw them ban out Fenrir when they ended up taking this away from Sonic's 8-6. But they knew through their own homework that Beast Coast... For the majority of their bans on the defensive side of the coin this entire stage, they've been removing Fenrir. So instead of removing it themselves, they thought that Beast Coast would just remove it for them. And they most definitely did. They take out Solus, they get the Fenrir ban for free, practically two bans that M80 wanted all on the defensive side. So very well done for them. Very happy that that worked out for them. But, uh, you know, the shield's coming through, Carter. We, we yeah. talked about how you really thought that the well, Monty was more than likely going to get banned out. I thought the Blitz. What, what were you thinking about the, uh, the Monty well, ban? I was about to say... Why don't you hold that thought? So that way we, have, we have something well, to come. We have something to come back to because I do believe uh -oh. we have a bit of a break to toss to. Unfortunately, no, we so we've don't. got a tech pause. So we'll uh, be right. We'll be right back uh, after this with more shield talk. It's just like two okay. seconds. We just had to get it figured out. We just, yeah, you, you know, thought. we had to listen. When you have to literally crack open the game servers, you don't want to reveal what's inside. Okay, you don't want to see how the sausage gets made. You don't want to see how it works. But I did promise something. We would get back. That we would talk about the shield, Sam, the blitz ban we saw from M80, and I thought it'd be the Monty. I'm going to keep it so real with you. I thought the Monty was going to be the more pressing ban for M80, but the Blitz taking down that player who can take quick control of Bunker, not a bad idea. Yeah, and I think it extends a little bit, you know, more vastly to Oregon as well. Uh, you know, you look at the map and you look to see what the heck happens routinely when it comes to a lot of these collisions that we see both of these, you know, you know, the offense and the defense on a, you know, course for. Blitz is usually a better option for things when it's a little bit more congested because he can be more aggressive. He has the ability to flash people out. He has the ability to try and work that pistol out from behind the shield in a little bit better circumstance than Monty just because he does have that flash on the front. Whereas Monty, he's a constant aggression, but there's tools inside of the defensive kit uh, that you can use to try and work your way around him. And I think that that's what M80 is really focusing on and the fact that they want to try and limit people like hot and cold and people like spirits who are both very talented shield players uh and their ability to try and open up these rounds when they get on the offense i can see sport taking a bit of a quick control on that white stairs using the ash charge down below covers the sound allows him to get up to the top of that staircase where there is one beast coast roamer currently playing 
thinking about a bit of a hunt, but of course there are those two defenders on top, Freezer and inside of security, who could flank him from behind. Just gotta be careful, but with that drone, you start backing off. We'll fire some shots. Away his position. And Gavini will remain. Now I'm starting to get curious. They had a red ping on him. Surely they know he's here at this point. It seemed like Spoit did, and Gavini doesn't really feel all that worried right now. But as we don't see Spoit actually deal with him, anybody anybody go for that pinch on the top floor? By the way, we're a minute 40 seconds in, by the way. No, oh, he doesn't know! I There's... gave M80 far too much credit. Yeah, you, you really did. You really did. Gotta read the body language sometimes there, my friend. But uh, that was definitely one of those moments. Spoit had no idea from the jump. The, the drones completely miscalculated on this top floor. And uh, I hate to say it, that's got to be one of the most routine spots you see somebody. So M80 just really not paying oh, attention to, to some of their corners him. and oh, things no. along those lines. If he gets away with another kill right here, this is all... Yep, that's the round right there. That This is absolutely absurd. GG. They should not be going GG. down this way for M80 at all. Gav, are you good for two? I don't think you are. You shouldn't be, and you won't be. Kino's going to gun him down. But with 30 seconds remaining, M80 have so much to do on the basement level. But Noodle, there's no way. You I shut your mouth. You good. shut your mouth. One versus two. He's gunned down. It's a trade kill, though. Beast Coast get away with one person alive. What was that round? Let's let's start at the very beginning here. Dude. We see a full map clear from M80 that ends, at least the clear ends, with Gavini going completely unnoticed on the top floor, whilst Spoit is also working the area, and not a single person is aware of the soul uh, that is just existing inside of games. Yeah, uh, once, once you see M80 committing to hunting down this Goyo, with 55 seconds left. That's in so insane. It, it, it's like this This round is probably cooked. Like, unless they find this guy in the next, like, literally the next five seconds. Like, if they do not find him immediately, let alone if they drop another body and Gavini's able to go one for one after the opening kill on Despoit, the round is cooked at that point. I mean, I was sitting there like, okay, you know, they see the super aggressive position on Freezer, White Stair, or sorry, Freezer, Security, and inside of Generator. This is before I knew that they missed around Gavini. I was like, okay, they're probably going to set up for a pinch. They can see a lot of people here. They'll maybe try to get a big man advantage in one fell swoop. That'll make up for the amount of time they're spending on this part of the map. That'll mm -hmm. make up for the minute 40 seconds they've spent with not opening up many of the hatches, not getting a lot of pressure on maybe bottom laundry or the back tower stairs. That'll make up for it, because they'll get a 4v3. And then, of course, they missed Ron Gavini. That changes things entirely. And now, in hindsight, that round looks way more questionable, because, I mean, obviously, there were a lot of mute jammers. Hard to get intel. But what was M80 doing for those two minutes that they spent so long acquiring so little? I... You know, I think the main thing is, is that if we, it, it, let me, let me paint you a picture real quick. Let's think about this round as it happened. Now let's reposition Gavini from that top floor downstairs into a turtle setup. Everything that M80 did was completely correct, right? Right. Okay. So the, the thing is, is that Gavini being able to, I won't even say like circumnavigate or be able to like work his way around the drones, just being straight up missed drone by M80. Them not going through and making sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted. That is the reason that that round falls flat on its face. That's legitimately the only reason. And that that right there is why when you're droning things out, folks, you know, I, I know we probably got some young players in chat, some people that are trying to figure things out with a young team or just got on a college esports team or whatever. That is why we drone things out to the nth degree. Because if you don't, then there's a player like Gab that knows those corners are deep and he's just going to sit there and wait things out. And he ends the entire round all because of his own efforts. You, you can't have that kind of stuff, especially when you have a caliber of squad like you do with no. M80. And for Beast Coast, I mean, obviously, in the first couple play days, they were not particularly strong on either side. As Spirits mentioned, they were going through an identity crisis. The attacks and the defenses were a problem, but there were bigger issues to concern themselves with that affected both sides, but they couldn't immediately start tailoring their strategy for one or the other. But since then, they have started to refine both sides of play. And against SSG yesterday, especially with those Monty executes, the attacks mm -hmm. looked quite good. And it seems with these defenses, which initially in the first few play days were less than stellar, if we want to be polite, now we're starting to look into a, a, quite a good position, not only because they can play off each other well, but you can see Gavini go for plays like that, go for one-for-ones. And instead of seeing haphazard or ad hoc, it seems like part of an overall strategy. Yeah, it feels way more sound. 
And the other thing is, is it, it doesn't feel as though, like, if that does go awry, that Beast Coast are now less than, you know? And, and that's a great feeling as well when you have players that can make some of these grandiose things happen on either side of the coin when they can go for some more of these high-flying antics. Uh, it's great to have a team that can, you know, fall back on their backbone when those things go wrong because that isn't going to be 100% accurate. That's just not how the game of Siege works. You're never going to find a player that is going to hit, you know, their uh, mark 100% of the time in that scenario. So it's really nice to have kind of things building upon themselves for BC uh, in that regard. It's, it's looked so very well done throughout this entire stage. And I think it goes to what Spirit said, uh, you know, inside of that little video that we saw on the analyst desk. They have players from across practically the four corners of North America. The four corners that you really care about, right? And it, it makes to where they all have a really solid understanding of how Siege is played, how these systems should be implemented, oh, and now they're creating their own, and it's looking beautiful. Citizen got a bit of intel on that player playing inside of the closet. Passive angle at the moment. Talk about a team with players from all four corners of the earth. Europeans, Brazilians, Brazilian Americans. Oh, no and, way. Well, none can hold a candle to Beast Coast <laughs> defenders at the moment. Diffuser fries Citizen off that am angle. Cameron on the Deimos. Cut down as the second. Dust talked about M81 of the most prolific Deimos users in the entirety of the NA League. Citizen playing him, Noodle playing him, Cameraman in this particular case playing him. But none of the utility, none of the positions, the operators, anything for M80 is working out so far. Gunner's even fallen back from the big tower position he was holding earlier. Now rotated into attic. They've also, or Beast Coast have also reinforced off the bedroom wall, forcing some hard breaching out of M80, but credit to Spoit. He reacts very quickly, and one thing M80 still have. With the Dopey and the Blitz being banned, they've got Ying and Grim on the board, some of the strongest execute ops we have in the game. And if anything get a man advantage back, it'll be the utility of those two. Well, time and time again, when M80's bell has been rung, it's okay, been Spoit that has answered the call and been the one that pulls them back across the line. Beast Coast, though, battering and bruising M80 at every single corner. It's down to Kino and Spoit. If you toss Citizen in there, you can talk about the three stars that we've seen across this entire stage for M80. We've had some moments for Noodle. We've had some moments for Cameraman. But it's been these three that have made the most out of situations that seem to be nothing but dust. And so far, it's looked at least somewhat good. Very minimal time remaining. I don't think they get that much farther. And Kano's going to get done, gunned down more than likely a sign of the times, and it will be a BC round on the top floor. And just a strong defense. Also, I want to highlight something, okay? Because he gets a lot of flack, and I want to take some time to praise him. Gunner is a lot of things. Very good player. But he sometimes has a bit of an over-aggressive streak. He sometimes can peek a little too far. I believe Super said on a co-stream, he's a great player with the talent for dying at random moments in 5v5 situations. And it's true. If you even watched the SSG game yesterday, a lot of times Gunner's sticking his head in the window where it doesn't belong, dies early. Takes a gunfight, he shouldn't, dies early. This time, is he playing on a far off position? Yes, but it's big tower with the Azami, a calm position to play. But look at right there. Kino is praying Gunner peaks the entirety of that final minute. And Gunner doesn't give him an opening until the round's pretty much lost with seven seconds left. Yep. And Against the SQ game, that's how M80 were finding a lot of their owning openings. Kino in particular were finding a lot of their openings. SQ getting a bit over aggressive, M80 punishing them. It might seem like something small there, but the fact that Gunner plays so patiently in Attic and never takes the fight until the round is pretty much won anyway, not only is indicative that Gunner can rein it in when it matters, but also East Coast can rein it in and deny M80 a way back into these attacks. Yeah, and also just to put this out there as well, a great recognition of uh, one's own reliance to try and get into those early engagements, you know what I mean? Because because honestly, at the end of the day, when you have an advantage like that in Siege and you're able to play things out on time, especially from the defensive perspective, the, my thought has always been, Carter, why not? Why not? Force them into a bad scenario. Force them into a bad swing. There's so many things that are poor that can happen to the offense in a situation like that. And oh, speaking of poor, M80, they've Huge. been completely discovered. Yeah, you know, you're at least gonna have Gunner get down for at least a moment, but they'll pick up Cameraman. And this is already a huge deal. M80 now down for the third time in this game, and it's only round three. <laughs> that is actually kind of unfortunate timing for M80 right there, because as you saw, there was actually a big gap in the defense. And then right as Cameraman goes up the hatch, Spirits is like, oh, Gunner's down. I got to go help him. Walks up, 
Did somebody just break through the hatch inside security and is able to get the opening pick. So I think M80 found a very real hole in the defense right there. And then Spirits just rotates and fills it at the exact wrong time for M80. He's even able to get Gunner back up. So East Coast fully reclaiming that 5v4. Still holding this top floor control as well with Gavini and Hot and Cold both upstairs. Two attackers though, looking to cut them into moving into Trophy. And with the defense a little separated, oh. especially Hot and Cold found inside of Attic. A couple picks could go M80's way if they play their cards right. And you gotta be worried for hot and cold inside of that attic. It's a soft wall and there's an LMG on the other side. If he makes a misstep, he's more than likely gonna end up getting ball banged and that'll be a big opener for M80. Gonna be spoilt onto Gunner instead, who more than likely was flanking. We saw that player around the main stairs, but not too much to come from it just yet. Gav's gonna back off. I do know there's still some players over inside of Small Tower. Refire coming out from the Valk now and not too much to find. Both of these teams a little discombobulated trying to figure out how to be able to line themselves up once again across from each other. It just favors the defense though. I mean, Gav can feel a little insecure. Maybe I need to rotate back. Maybe I need to go upstairs. But as you see, M80's insecurity is their gain because now they rotate over and are trying to go for a fast play through Green Hall, but hot and cold right around the corner with his shotgun. Here's the bar breaks. Easy Runegate deleted. He's only able to down one though. No, he does get the kill on Spoit. But it's only a 3v3 as he's quickly traded out by M80. Great reaction right there. Oh no, Gavini giving his position away a little too early. Tries to salvage it by hopping on the boosted angle. Well, thankfully come away with his life. Citizen taking a lot of damage on the entry into the meeting position. Forced to back off even. Kino shut down with that diffuser. Great find by diffuser. Great double find by the diffuser. And Gavini still alive on that roam. Gets the third kill on the execute. Gets Beast Coast third as well. These defenses are looking so very solid for Beast Coast right now. M80 have only been able to garner one advantage this entire time, and really it didn't make any headway towards the site. It's going to be attack timeout from them, and M80 have a lot to discuss. These offenses so far have not been very clean. They haven't been able to make, you know, solid headway towards the actual site, with really any man advantage going their way. Not three times now, Beast Coast have been able to get that open pick, get that 5v4, but honestly, more importantly, not throw it away in any either long-term capacity. If it's if a kill's been traded out in the case of, you know, Gunner being found on that flank, Hot and Cold's able to set himself up in a position to anticipate the rotate from M80 on back tower side and still keep it at even contest, still keep M80 on the back foot, keep them guessing, force them into positions in which they are uncomfortable. So the Beast Coast defenses have looked excellent so far, as you said, especially getting a win on Meeting Kitchen, where the entire time it seemed they were one step ahead or were keeping M80 more one step behind them. Now they get to go back down to basement and dorms after this. Obviously, this is the time to okay, see what to adaptations M80 have, but the these have been three very comfortable rounds from Beast Coast without a whole lot of mistakes on their part. Oh, very true. They've looked sound across the entire board, you know, and, and that's something that is really hard fought, especially for teams like Beast Coast that just came together what seems to be like a fortnight ago, right? Like Beast Coast have not been together for that long and they're already, you know, capable of producing rounds like this up against M80. Yes, it's Oregon. Yes, it's Oregon defense, but still M80 is a really, really solid roster that has uh, you know, more than the right, more than the capability to take away rounds from Beast Coast on the offensive side of things. Uh, and it's been a perfect defensive half so far from Beast Coast. That's why we see this timeout so early from M80. They're a little worried. Yeah, a lot of the times on Oregon, a lot of the times in NA, I will say, I mean, it's definitely been a bit of a defender-sided league at the moment. A lot of teams in rebuilds and typically... If you're figuring things out, whether you're a new roster like Beast Coast or bringing on a new IGL in the case of SSG, or even in some ways M80, new IGL to Spoit and Kino, the attacks are usually the part that comes later. The defenses are a bit easier to figure out, but that coordination on the attack, that momentum is a bit more difficult to find with a new roster. So right here on Oregon, a map that is typically always decided by who can get more of those attacking rounds, getting as many as you can here, at least two would be ideal. Maybe even one, depending on what happens. The demo's going out. At least this time, we are seeing a bit more use from early on, because when Cameraman last played Demos, he was pretty much one of the first two dead and found no impact with those trackers. But here, though, on a full anchor setup, he's not going to find a whole lot of impact in the early round, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely not. Full sidebar for a second. Love the fact that Hot and Cold's rocking the old OXG MP5 uh, tractor skin. The very the first Deere. OXG skin that ever came out. 
Amazing stuff. Love I actually love here. that skin. You know, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's not for the looks, it's not for anything. It's simply just because of the nostalgia oh. factor. But uh, either way, M80 is still making some solid progress on this mid floor. There's really nothing in the way for them, minus some utility pieces around these stairwells for them to try and get some of these hatches open, try to get some of these angles freshened up. Uh, and then we'll start to work into execution period. Execution time! Spoit flirting there with an M590 that he didn't really know about. He knows about it now. That's the thing with that mute jammer. I mean, you generally should probably assume, like, all right, if I can't drone down there, there might be somebody play aggressive. Not for sure, but might. And he'll quick peek and thankfully dodge away, dodge out of the way of that shotgun shell fired by spirits in response. He also saw one of the death marks actually fail because Cameron tried to track him, and obviously being in the radius of a mute jammer, and the death mark tracker being electronic in nature, was not able to start pinging Spirits' location. I believe Cameron might actually, yeah, he's out of those for the remainder of the round, and sure, you've got a lot of great utility for this execute. You've got the Capital Bolt, smoke and fire alike. You've got the swarm grenades from Citizen, but having the ability to maybe just power that player playing in laundry or playing in long haul and have full intel when Cameron floods into the site, lacking that could be a bit of a problem. There's a lot of utility still for M80, but lacking that could give a, the edge to a Beast Coast defender in a gunfight where they might have lost it otherwise. Look at this time. 5v5, there's 30 seconds remaining. So many different bastions existing for Beast Coast. They'll be able to persist and try and extend themselves up towards these gates where M80 are going to attempt to enter. Diffuser has the goggles on. He's not able to find too much, though. M80 capable of dislodging the players inside of the mirror. Not only that, but getting the plant down. This is something that I did not think that they were going to be able to do. And Noodle with a triple kill. Cameraman with the last one. I cannot believe my eyes carter m80 they completely sweep the entire deck they are able to repel beast coast and not only that they're able to lodge themselves directly into the heart of this site kill these players around this mirror and make this entire laundry space their own home in the matter of like 15 seconds you obviously got to give Noodle a lot of credit there, you know, pushing in with that buck into the small closet, dealing with the player on the mirror window, because on a front side plant, if maybe not necessarily there's a warden playing there, but if you've got somebody with a C4, that could spell doom for your execute entirely. So I like that play from Noodle, and then he ends up getting a 3K to boot. That's all very nice. One thing I do actually find a little bit interesting, I'm sure as you guys noticed, Diffuser was the first player to get a kill there, cutting down Citizen, but right as he turns on the glasses, when he goes to for the swing on the mirror window, obviously when you move, the glasses start fudging a little bit. You know, you have to be stationary to see through that smoke, and as he moves, that's actually the exact moment Kino goes in to start planting the Diffusers, so Diffuser actually can't find the exact intel on his position. Kino ends up slipping by unnoticed, and he can't react to Noodle pushing him in time. So, a bit of favorable timing going Kino's way there, because while Diffuser had the right play, just the way the gadget works ended up costing him a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's something that kind of, you know, people forget about Warden as well, is that he does have that aspect where he works a little bit like glass, you know? You do have to stand still in order for those glasses to work through smoke. And when you even have to take what would be, you know, at least assumingly, a, a micro movement, two steps to the right, it's Some just movement. enough to be able to mess up those glasses. And that right there is just enough for M80 to be able to pick up a round, at least for Noodle's sake, as he flew into that closet of two, maybe three beautiful kills there. Now, into round five we go. M80. Kind of fast acting, at least initially, but we knew there was nobody up top. It's just going to be Kino trying to get some ground for them as they'll have quick access to the top of the tower through Amaro. <laughs> Noodle with quick access to the opening round. The Diffuser looking to make that a very short-lived advantage. Instead, Gunner to make it a 4v4. Sound around the garage window. That'll perk Diffuser's ears. How has Gunner what? killed Cameraman with the super shorty? And this could be a 4v2 right now, depending on what Diffuser finds. I think the call Noodle's might be given down to three back. I was about to say, you can see Noodle is just immediately downstairs inside a pillar, as Sam just mentioned. Beast Coast going for a very loose roam, but one that I think maybe you're making the call to leave. Noodle and Kino both downstairs, but Sploy with the Diffuser is just too far away. Ooh. Where is he right now? I mean, genuinely... Yeah, I was going to say, this this round is practically just burned out all because of the solid utility from Beast Coast. M80, I think that they have a pretty good understanding of what the heck is happening with this Beast Coast roam, but then we see them try and work their way over to the pillar position off of Noodle's recommendation, more than likely, you know, just his calls working out from that scenario. Uh, but those gas canisters, especially from Hot and Cold, man, 
they just make it to where the entire area, you can't traverse it, Carter. You can't work your way in anywhere. What are you going to do? Run over to Elbow and try and take a fight with that guy who is 100% prepared for it? That That's not something that's going to happen. So M80, especially with that play that they were going for initially, they just get completely stunted. Beast Coast unaware of this obviously they weren't the one who even activated the goyo but that single panel on the soft wall goyo that w they ended up placing that's exactly what slowed this round up to this point it's just so insane sometimes that it can boil down to something as simple as that i i also cannot believe gunner has somehow worked his way past spoit the a breach, triple and he's still on the yeah, mid floor yeah the, the breach opening up gunner exactly still on the mid floor everyone from beast coast playing passive this boy can surely find the vigil on this oh, come on. angle. No, he runs right around oh. the bench. They only trade. Diffuser's able to find the kill before he's taken down. Noodle, just where he began, in the bomb site, but it's not enough to get the round over the line. I want to go back and watch that defense because it happened so fast. We missed a lot of the finer details, but arrived at the conclusion all the same. Beast Coast up 4-1. Yeah, uh, you know, short, skinny version, M80. I, I think they did a really solid job of trying to get things worked, at least over towards the pillar position. They didn't really understand where we were going to see Gunner around that round. No solid control over yeah. the meeting area. Uh, they really just wanted to try and reinforce things around Noodle because they assumed that they were going to be able to just fly into sight off of the positioning from Noodle. But because of that utility being in place, because of the two Goyo canisters, the ones that we saw over in Freezer and the single panel one that we saw blown up by the likes of M80, it completely stunted that it makes it to where they can't try and work their way into sight anymore they can't go and try and take up those gunfights that they thought that they could uh and now they have to try and go back to you know uh their basics and there's really nothing there for them because they really didn't accomplish that much across the mid floor right we, we see gunner being able to run a muck of that entire scenario and that would be the basic that they're trying to go back to so over complicates things and m80 really never able to pull things back across the line Kind of crazy we see that strat get whipped out on the third base on defense. I mean, with how far out Beast Coast were set up and the nature of basement, you know, because the side is so strong, you don't often see super extended or super aggressive roams like that. Mm -hmm. Kind of surprised that, obviously, it might have been a strat Beast Coast had in the back pocket anyway, but, you know, think especially after round one, we'd see maybe that pulled out on the second baseman defense, but no. Third try, catches M80 completely off guard. Either shows the depth of Beast Coast playbook or shows the prowess they have calling an audible. Still a very solid round for the final defense. Sam, we are going back up to dorms. So Beast Coast will evade defending that tertiary bomb site for a second time this half. And go instead to a site that they were still very strong on. Oh, dorms and probably the most straightforward operator lineup you could potentially ask for on this top floor. Uh, I mean, you got Frost for the windows. You've got even barriers to try and harden up a few of these softer points around this top floor, especially over towards the dorms position. And then, uh, you know, if you've been watching Siege for a while, you know the rest of this tried and true trio. We got good info, got good ability to try and soak up some things as well as smoke along for the ride. Trying to lay. Gonna be Gav to strike first. You'd expect oh, yeah. that out of your Valkyrie as he'll be able to take down Noodle. This is a great start here for Beast Coast in what I do believe is their fifth out of six available entries. Really strong from Beast Coast in the early game, and I think that's just from an, from an old favorite on Oregon, either hopping out of the white window or finding a run on that side, as we did see Noodle on the rappel on the uh, gen window. Maybe Noodle's also going to clear small tower late. Either way, just a bit of a jump out or a bit of a peek on the opposite side of the map. Gives Gavin there first and Beast Coast. Not really daunted all that much. I think it was Diffuser in this spot last time that smoked Citizen off that angle. But Gunner's playing a little more passive. Putting up the Keeper Barricades, keeping the 5e4, forcing M80 to use all of their utility to accomplish relatively little. Some of the smokes even coming out for Beast Coast at this point to stall out the flood in through Trophy. But to M80's credit, they have a lot of the base angles they need. They have the bedroom wall opened up. Beast Coast were not able to get out the reinforcement this time. They also have both the Yings and some Bs in the back oh, pocket, wow. but again! Diffuser 2-0 against Citizen on this bedroom angle. M80 in the 3v5 going into the final 45 seconds. And M80, you can see, once again, they've hit this brick wall. They don't know how they need to go about this. Beast Coast have been able to not only get the initial picks, but also make these points of the setup where they've been able to extend themselves out a little bit farther. They've been able to reinforce these positions with solid utility. And now M80 have to try and battle back. 
Hammerman trying to assist from Attic. He won't be able to do too much so far. It's a Spoit show, uh, but it has been time and time again. We're going to have another player go down. Uh -oh. Gunner. Spirits is going to kill him with the smoke diffuser in from behind Spoit. He'll be able to at least take out one more. But now before we see Spirits clean it up with the M590, Beast Coast with a 5 and one defensive half here on Oregon. Really, really strong defensive half, too. I mean... It is, it is rare that I come away with a defensive half just seeing, just thinking to myself, man, they stumped the attack. You could see M80 trying to do things, trying to get things started, bringing the right operators, clearing the right util. But on dorms, both times, that Azami in that closet position, M80 had some decent utility cleared. They were able to take off a lot of that utility that made it easier to play directly in closet. But Beast Coast still weren't giving it up. They were still getting aggressive, and both times M80 were completely caught off guard by that. And to Beast Coast's credit, once they're getting these advantages, they're winning gunfights that M80 give them. They are not seeking anything they don't need to. They are not pushing too far all that much. Now, to be fair, they did let that 5v2 slip into the 2v2, and not exactly great. They still got the round over the line, and through all of these rounds, the three basements, the one meeting, the two dorms, Beast Coast's defensive half has looked really strong. But to be fair... Their attacks took a little bit to get going yesterday. The one thing I'm thinking about is exactly what Hot and Cold has brought. Mm -hmm. They had that Monty. It was smooth sailing against SSG. I think this is so smart. Beast Coast, as you said, they had a couple of issues, some, some rough chop, you could say, out on sea for Beast Coast. Uh, and they finally found the angle they needed to try and cross these waves. And it just so happened to come in the form of a Monty. And I think that it's going to happen again. I like that they're not trying to go back to something different. They're try not trying to reinvent the wheel card. Or they're like, nope, this worked, and we're going for it. Monty's in the lineup. We want to try and be able to take control here. We're going to have two hard breachers to back this up. Secondary hard breach for Buck. Also having the Maverick come in here, too. Uh, I think that this is a really stellar lineup for Beast Coast. I'm excited for how round seven goes. We might, they, you know, They might have six rounds here. Now they might if we're just thinking about the momentum they were able to gather with this kind of execute yesterday. But to be fair to M80, Beast Coast have to go through Basement. And Basement is perennially going to be a site that we're at least leaning towards the defense, especially when M80 aren't trying to change things up too much. We have a bit of an aggressive hold on Back Tower, but it's just to allow Spoit to rotate back. That's the entire reason the Warden is there. Kino on Freezer Stater is still in a very default position, has got the C4 on the doorway just to ward off the Monty, dissuade him from pushing in. Of course, he basically gives up the C4 now, unfortunately. So he will likely have to back up, maybe not have it for the late round where it would otherwise be important, but... East Coast getting good information at the moment. Know that they're trying to contest Freezer early. Not sure what, what exactly they know on the backside. I know they saw the Azami earlier, but since then, a lot of positions have changed. It seems Beast Coast are just going to get on their way with their normal clear. Hiki. Really smart decision here from him. I was a little worried about him, Carter. Once that hatch gets open, you do have to take some risks to try and cross Holy back gosh. across that freezer space. But instead, Spoit. Oh, going to be a full dislodgement here from Gunner. He's going to check the corner, unlike what we saw inside the wild card game where Wi-Fi was able to take full control of the round from that position. Instead, Spoit loses his life. Now Beast Coast, they've got the pick that they've been looking for for so very long, starting to work their way onto oh. site. It's going to be hot and cold with a lot of information here from Freezer. But notably not with the Diffuser. He's just applying pressure. Spirits is the guy with the case, so as they flood in, this Diffuser's getting planted on the big tower side, oh if we even need gosh. it to go there. Gunner flooding into the site has got two big kills. Kino finds one on the Monty ADSing just for the, just for the memes at this point. The buck now down, but he's just wasting Kino's time. He's allowing Spirits to put that diffuser on the floor, softening him up a little bit too for Gunner on the triple to finish it off. Match point for Beast Coast, a very, very strong attack right out the gate. Yeah, if uh, you just came back at the midpoint of the season and looked at the uh, the results that we'd had, if you looked at the leaderboard and the standings of the NAL, you looked at things and been like, Beast Coast, they're kind of doing a little bit better than I'd exactly give them merit for. And uh, yeah, I think that that 
at least can be silenced for now. <laughs> when you're going up against a team that is as stacked as M80, uh, and you're kind of in similar circumstances, right? It's kind of a, a reworking period. You're bringing in some new people. You're trying to figure out everybody's identities across the board, especially for M80's sake. I mean, a whole different IGL in here. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different moving parts to this. Beast Coast, though, they've not only hit their stride, they've looked fantastic practically every single step of the way. And I think if you were going into this game, and I was thinking some of these thoughts myself, looking at Beast Coast results in the games where they have looked so good and saying, okay, they beat SQ, who obviously now with a lot more games under our belt are clearly one of the weaker teams this stage of the NAL. They beat Dark Zero, which that game was DZ's low point, like their absolute low point of the stage. And then they followed up with a 7-5 over SSG. You're like, okay, the first two games, definitely at least either at that time or in totality weaker. 7-5 over SSG, okay, Still maybe a bit underperforming for SSG, but that's a solid win. This was the game where I was like, is this team truly for real? Because I was buying into it, but I was now looking for like full confirmation that Beast Coast are here to play. 6-1 on the attacking side. Obviously, M80 could come back to no slouches, but I am fully on the Beast Coast train now because with a regulation win, they are in the playoffs, my friend. Yeah, especially after that basement defense uh, out of M80 going to Rye. You know, Beast Coast having more than the capabilities of handling that. And not only that, but making sure that they do cross those T's and they do dot those I's like we were talking about earlier in the day, right? They did not let things go awry that were uh, definitely <laughs> built upon from M80, like Sploit over there inside of T1. And I think that Beast Coast being able to combat against those antics, uh, it's just so very smartly done out of them so far, oh, Kino! Wait. He gets punished by the most default cross on this top floor. You don't usually just wander, meander out into that space. And he does. He's immediately punished. Parker's got the nerf black for your tweet already, already written out after that kill. Exactly though. Gunner just sitting on the gen window. Maybe Blackbeard, sure. Maybe a different different operator than we see, but just sitting there. Goes unread. Still here. And I was about to say he's Blackbeard. No he doesn't Stop need it. to. He puts Citizen down to below 50. He's just trying to go for the rotate, just trying to hop across, and Gunner certainly punishes him for it. Sploit now finished off. What? We have a 7-1 on the cards for Beast Coast. He's at the 5v3. They're requiring that out of control. They still got Gunner on this angle, cutting the entire site off, but a little bit of a mistake there. The Electric Claw is able to reactivate in time to cut off that remaining Selma, but because of the work they've done so far, Hot Call not really worried. Look at and this. Beast Coast at not this. concerned at all. Caraman's in small tower. He doesn't even get more than one. My boy's in the most impactless position, but not entirely his fault. Beast Coast are looking far improved from their woeful state at the beginning of the stage. And on attack or defense, this team is legit. It's a 7-1 victory for the tide of Beast Coast. And M80, y'all got a lot to think about, man. These antics, these crazy things that you're trying... I want to be honestly, I'm not even going to try and, you know, go over the top here. Not even crazy things that you're going for strategically, but some of these, you know, more high-flying antics that you were trying out, trying to get in the face of Beast Coast, it just simply did not work. And even past that, that last take that we saw to Beast Coast Carter, that's one of the more straightforward takes on the top floor. You got two people set up over on the master side, two people trying to help with Attic at that moment in time, and Spirit kills, you know, Spoil over on double window. Where else do you think that last player is going to be? They're more than likely not going to be trying to apply themselves over towards white. That's kind of played out. They're probably going to be over on double window. And M80, they're just so, you know, they're trying to dissect themselves and figure things out in the moment. So many things going on. Uh, they just get completely bowled over by C, uh, BC, who are cool, calm, and collected. Uh, and they are more, you know, well within their right to take this entire game. Now, I will say this. I've been here before as a Beast Coast fan. Stage one of last year, very different roster. Beast Coast seemed like they might end up being a dark horse for the major. They've reclaimed that spot, and I don't want to get my hopes up, but I have to say, I think they might just do it. I think this iteration might just do it. But we are already halfway done with the day after that very quick affair on Oregon. We got the desk to break down that dominant win right after this.
be honest, I don't know if there's a better way to get into the playoffs than to beat a team that is already in the playoffs. M80 tried to play gatekeepers in this matchup, but Beast Coast just proved they were the superior team. 5-1 half to start on Oregon defense and just blew through M80 from the word go. Beast Coast are our third team, now going to the best of threes, and M80 are just going to try and hope to shake this one off because now Beast Coast are on a four-game winning streak. Yeah, I mean, Beast Coast have been seriously impressing me. These last couple of games, the ideas that they keep bringing to these matches, their coordination inside the server, I've been really, really happy with this. We talk about Beast Coast as a squad who, yeah, you know, it's it's five different players coming from five different teams. They should have problems with coordination to start things off, but they really haven't been. It, it feels like a team that has been playing together for so much longer than they actually have. And we may look at the map that we talked about beforehand and be like, oh, Oregon, like, of course they were going to win. They started defenses first, but the amount of unique abilities, the, the zombie that they were using, the different yeah. looks that Beast Coast were doing to keep M80 on their toes consistently. And they didn't let M80 slip them up once. They weren't getting caught out. And obviously, seven opening kills to one opening kill. Yep. That showed they weren't letting the kills affect them either. The one time we saw M80 win a round was the it was laundry defense, and it was the time they took Freezer in main, and Noodle was just sent in as Buck to try and take Spawn yeah. Claws. Oh, he got in there. And just said, you know, he got in there, and they won the round, but that was the one time they were able to successfully do anything. Every yes. other time, Beast Coast lockout over and over and over again on defense. Yeah, and the key thing about that laundry round, it was the only time they defended laundry, and they chose not to roam. Rounds one and five, they went for the roam games, and I want to kind of highlight these rounds in particular, because both times we saw Beast Coast going for a hyper-aggressive roam, and they, the first time, obviously, you know, it's a missed drone. They don't realize that uh, that Gavin is top floor. That's fine. But what I want to highlight is the response. They notice this roamer's up top, and they make the call on M80 to say, we got to clear this guy. We have a low, low time at the moment, about a minute on the clock, but we're going to spend our time to try to get this guy out of here because we don't want to have to deal with him late round. And what ends up happening is a disaster. Gavin gets a second kill playing up here inside of kids' dorms. They don't have good enough intel on him. Obviously, they didn't have their drones at the start. They don't have it now. He will eventually die here, or in a moment here. There it goes. But it's already wasted so much time. He's killed two bodies. He has basically won the round for his teammates. And the push ends up so scattered, so last moment from M80. They just don't have a chance. Easy cleanup from the anchors. The next time they do an aggressive roam strategy, again, the roamers find the two opening picks. Beast Coast make a different decision. They say, we're not going to focus on the roamers. We're instead just going to hit sight. We know there's these players aggressive on the top floor. Let's go hit sight. What happens? There's a Goyo canister on a soft wall that they buck open that completely stalls all their momentum. And then Gunner, who was the player on the roam that got the first two opening picks, is able to continue to have impact. This is exactly why they didn't want to ignore the roamers, because as you'll see from Gunner on the hatch, he's able to come in from the back and continue to pinch. It just felt like whatever choice M80 made was wrong. So if there's anything like consistent that Beast Coast did that enabled this kind of play style, that got them to a point where that 5-1 half was at all possible in the first place, Fox, is there anything that Beast Coast were doing in particular that you really liked this game? Absolutely. I love that Beast Coast were not scared. We're going to see in this clip right now that they were just one step ahead of M80 every single time. A lot of M80's attacks are based on fear. They want you to move into uncomfortable positions, but Beast Coast was so spread out that they were always able to gather information. Hot and Cold was on Big Tower. Not only does he go one for one to get the trade, but he sees three members from M80, the whole team that rotated over to Big Tower. He gathers all of the information and is able to relay it to the rest of Beast Coast. Beast Coast can set up confidently that there's nobody behind them, and Diffuser is able to just clean it up because the time was not on M80's side. They meant for a split adaptation, and unfortunately, just Hot and Cold was in the right place at the right time. And a lot of these rounds, Beast Coast was in the right place at the right time to get all the information, and they didn't let themselves get scared by M80. Guide the back end of that clip, by the way, Diffuser with the 2K on Kitchen. Phenomenal game out of the Rook. It's great when we can like point at rookies and say, hey, they're in the hot seat. They need to do really good. Diffuser had a mammoth game when it really, really counted for BC today. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked about uh, rounds where Beast Coast defend on meeting. We've talked about rounds where they defend on the basement. Diffuser, for me, was most impactful on that top floor, consistently holding down closet, really shutting up uh, Citizen, who did not have a good game. Big reason why Citizen struggled in this matchup was because Diffuser was so consistently able to shut him out of where he wanted to come on in. We saw a lot of that util coming through from Diffuser and the rest of his teammates, whether that's playing around the Kiba barriers, playing around the Wamai magnets, it all meshed so perfectly together, and Diffuser was be being put in the right place at the right time and hit the shots. And Spirits talked about it in the pregame that 
now they have Diffuser playing comfortably, playing yes. the roles that he wants to play, the position where he wants to be, and obviously he's thriving at it. It makes them feel that much more comfortable when you're watching Beast Coast. And on the other side, M80, this is the first time that I've seen M80 go down this divisively and just not have a response back. And I really think the comfort was not in their side because if you look at the kill cams, mm -hmm. after each M80 loss, everybody was quiet on M80. Nobody was necessarily having a response or an answer to what to do. And I do think that has a little bit to do with Oregon because yeah. Oregon, it's really hard to find a response. There isn't that many opportunities. Even if you're Meepy and on wildcard, <laughs> eventually you're gonna run out of outs. Yeah, and I mean, we saw it in the stat line too. Citizen and Cameraman both not having the greatest of games. I believe a combined two and 11 through the attacking half. You gotta have those guys showing up. Citizen especially, you know, feels like the guy who needs to be part of that entry engagement finding those roamers. I don't want to put it, put it all on him because I do think the droning had to be a bit better to not get so caught off guard by some of those aggressive defensive plays. But obviously, if you're not having your big players putting up big numbers, it's going to be a problem. Let's see if there's anybody that's behind uh, on that Beast Coast team that's on cloud nine right now after how that game went. We got Gunner on the line real quick. Brother, the last time we got the chance to talk to you, it was an 0-3 skid. Everyone hopes that we can kind of wipe that off the board, so to speak. Now we come to you having one four straight lock in for playoffs. You might hate the question, but I really want to know, are you feeling relieved right now? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's great to make playoffs, but I mean, at the end of the day, like this was just a group stage and like those games, it's cool that we're winning all these games, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really mean anything and us, we can win a BO3. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously super excited that we made it to the playoffs after I'm our amazing start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you bring up it just being you know, the regular season, because we highlighted that it didn't look like you guys were scared by M80 at all. You guys held your ground every single step of the way. Was that a lot more just confidence because it's not as important as the playoffs or was it strategy and preparation? No, I mean, I just don't think there's a team right now that will like genuinely get in our heads. I just think we're on like, I mean, if you heard the like what goes on before the games, dude, like I don't even like, it's just too fun. We're just having too much fun right now. Yeah, um, that's right. And, <laughs> But it's also like there's a lot of a lot a lot of hard work going in and there's a lot of bad days where we're not having fun. But like, you know, all those days make like days like this worth it because we're just going in so confident, knowing what we need to do and just executing. Nice. I mean, we clearly see the hard work. And after this statement 7-1 win, do you think that you guys finally have found your identity and this is the new normal Beast Coast that we should be expecting? Oh, 100 percent. I, I mean, I think like I mean, we have everyone comfortable, everyone's flourishing. Um, I mean, there's just right now, there's just nothing bad to say. Um, I'm having a great time. I, I know my teammates are too. So. Yeah, I mean, you've been a joy to watch so far, Gunner, your whole team, because it feels like every single match you come in and you just have so many good ideas that work perfectly. The executes seem like they're all going according to plan, whether that's Monty executes, whether that means a zombie Kiba setups, or even a Blackbeard on that final round. How much of that is pre-practice? You've got the ideas going into the game versus how much of it, of it is just like a judgment call towards the end? Uh, most of it's like pre-planned, mm -hmm. but I will say I brought Blackbeard one time in scrims <laughs> and then the team that I scrimmed said you wouldn't do that on game day. <laughs> so Fair. Just, out of, just out of spite, I went games window with uh, Blackbeard because I knew what like what the push we were doing with the Montane, uh -huh. assuming you would push him back. And I got my one, so. <laughs> you, gotta name, like... you gotta name drop the team now. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's just some secrets you don't give up. I get it. Let me throw a hypothetical at you real quick. You've already qualified for playoffs. Los have the next game that comes up in game three. If they lose, they can't make it to playoffs. So let's just say the game tomorrow doesn't end up really meaning all that much. From a standings perspective, you both are locked in or locked out already. Would that change the way that you guys would play the game tomorrow? Or would it still be standard fare and you treat it like any other best of one that you've played so far? Oh, I mean... We're we're going tomorrow to win. Losing sucks. So. <laughs> That's a pretty universal concept, we're, right, Fox? We're, we're going. We're going hard. Like it's any other game tomorrow. There's not going to be any let up. Well, fair play. Hopefully, the same exact play that you got you brought against M80 is going to show its ugly head again tomorrow against Los. Dude, again, congratulations on playoffs. Take a load off. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Good job, these guys. I feel proud watching them, even though they all have major experience. Hot and Cold's been playing for a long time, but to see it come together like this after that abysmal, sorry, amazing start, as Gunner put it, it's a really fun story right now. It's nice because I feel like everybody on the team 
just didn't get the they all got the short end of the stick on yes. prior rosters yep and so it's nice because it gives you a team that you want to love that you want to see succeed and of course because of that amazing start they had a rough road so it's nice to see them be able to just grab onto it and show a little bit more success obviously still a lot of ways to go yeah i mean i said it before the season started this should be the best roster beast coast has ever produced and Throw i the think tweet we're back seeing up. that <laughs> i think it officially is like they're they're finding wins they're the third team confirmed into playoffs they're playing call Confident. They've got good ideas. They're following through on them. I I've been really happy watching Beast Coast so far. I love seeing them succeed, and I'm excited to watch them in playoffs. Well, we've had one playoff confirmation today, but that's the only one we're going to see. The next two games that we have on the docket are both elimination potential. Los is on the chopping block first, and if they don't win, they're done. Coming up after the break.